Hello and welcome, and thank you all for being here today. My name is Dan Palanca, and I'm a senior product marketer here at Affinity. Uh, in this session, we'll discuss the results of our 2024 predictions report and get perspective and strategic insight from our amazing group of panelists. Um, speaking of whom, I'm excited to be joined by Sophie Winwood, operating partner at Fox Capital and WVCE, Jesse Bloom, partner at SAS Ventures, and Marcus Bull, managing director Europe at Intel Ignite. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, Sophie, perhaps you would love to, uh, you know, sort of get the story going by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your firm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And and, and really great to, to be on this webinar today. My name is Sophie Winwood. I'm an operating partner at Fox Capital. Fox Capital is a newly formed fintech fund um, investing in early stage founders, building in a world of fintech and beyond. We as a fund have um, over 20 years experience investing in fintech, um, a deep expertise and ecosystem within the space. And um, are really excited to see what, what's going to be coming out of that sector this year. Um, I also on the side of my desk run an initiative called WVC, which is a women in venture capital community promoting uh, inclusion and empowerment of women in VC globally. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Excited to get your perspective. Um, Jesse, how's it going today? Going well. Thank you very much. Good, good, good. To, glad to have you here. Um, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you and 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 what you guys are doing over at SaaS Ventures. Sure thing. Um, uh, SaaS Ventures is a multi-stage venture capital firm based out of Miami, but I sit here in the great city of New York. Um, I was a financial advisor prior to uh, business school and joining the venture capital world. While we are a multi-stage fund, I run our uh, growth operations here. It's called SaaS Growth. Um, we co-invest alongside the greatest venture capital firms in the world. We have a list on our website of the top 25, and we believe um, that brand uh, conquers all and that uh, access beats diligence in the long in the long haul. We're a bit unique in that. Uh, so we're co-investors. We play nice, and uh, we love getting involved in the best companies with, uh, with the best firms. Well, great. Great to have you here. We'll definitely be uh, excited to talk to you about that branding aspect a little bit later. Um, and finally, we have we have Marcus Bull. Marcus, thank you again for joining us. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and, and Intel Ignite? Yeah, Dan, thank you for having me. Um, Ignite is Intel's global startup program, which I run in Europe. So we have four locations, Tel Aviv, London, Munich, and Boston. Um, what we do, we basically run an acceleration program, non-dilutive for early stage startups. So anything pre-seed to including Series A. Um, and we only look into breakthrough innovation. So deep tech or frontier tech, uh, of course, a lot of AI, quantum computing, advanced manufacturing, hardware, um, DevOps, ML ops, all these kind of uh, stuff. So we we get a nice glimpse into the future in, in terms of technology, and um, we also try to keep up with uh, with our startups, with our portfolio companies in terms of the tech stack we have <laughs> and how we leverage AI and data. So it will be interesting to discuss this. And I'm myself, Excellent. I'm a founder, uh, so built various companies throughout my life, and now I try to help uh, other founders not make the same mistakes I made or that I saw in other companies. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, as you know, we we launched our 2024 investment predictions report at the uh, end of the year. Uh, this report was based on a survey that over 700 private capital professionals answered. Uh, the three main predictions that we uncovered within that survey were that investors anticipate more deals in 2024. Um, relationships and brand trust drive deals, and AI will help overcome deal complexity in the coming year. Um, and we'll dig deeper into these predictions today. But to get us started, I would love to go around and see if there are any big themes or goals that you and your firm are focused on as we kick off 2024. Uh, Marcus, would you care to get us started? Yeah, sure. So um, I think not a surprise, AI will dominate. Uh, we see a lot of AI and, and getting broad adoption to that. Um, so far, we always had a, a vertical that just said AI, machine learning, computer vision. Meanwhile, nine out of 10 teams have this baked into their value proposition. Um, if not at the core, then, then at a very relevant uh, level. Um, and for us as a company, it will be also how can we augment our operations and our, let's say, data advantage that we have with AI. 
um, to see more deals, to see them earlier and, and yeah, to, to better understand how big is the pond and what are the fish we are we're looking for. Excellent. I'm sure that will be a, a very common theme for, for some of us on the call today. Um, Sophie, would you care to share your perspective on uh, themes or goals as well? Yeah, absolutely. So being a predominantly early stage investor, so pre-seed, seed, early series A, we've really um, not been as impacted by the valuation fall as, for example, the growth stage. However, it is really starting to, to come down and we're hoping to see a level setting within the seed stage this year. So hopefully some more founders have ex understand the market they're, um, they're more kind of aware of, of what is expected from a valuation point. And that means that we can kind of, as an industry, begin to reset from this kind of fall that's come back from the public markets and start to build again. And hopefully with those more deals comes valuations that make sense for both the investors and the founders. Definitely. I think that's something we're all, we're all hopeful for. Um, Jesse, would you love to share some of the big things you guys have going on? Sure. Yeah, I agree with uh, Marcus that AI is going to play a big role in our investing thesis this year, but we're not changing much this year. On our uh, In our early stage fund, uh, we'd like to get into companies uh, a little bit more ownership and earlier on. Uh, that is because uh, it has been tougher to buy up in later stages than it was previously. Um, and we're looking to invest in more repeat founders uh, this year than, uh, than uh, you know, obviously founders that are less experienced. Uh, on the growth side, uh, we're brand new. Uh, we just closed. Um, uh, we had our first close on the growth front, front um, in uh, uh, in late Q2 in uh, 2023. So uh, we're just getting started on the growth side. Excellent. Well, congrats on that. Hopefully it's a a, a, a great endeavor for you guys. Um, as I mentioned previously, our report found that an overwhelming 89% of investors expect to see the same number or more deals in 2024. Uh, however, we also found that 56% of investors expect their biggest challenge in the upcoming year to be that LPs are turning away from the venture asset class altogether. Um, it would be great to hear where we're leaning in regards to 2024 optimism. And do you think there's a path forward to see more deals, even with a smaller LP pool? And I'll kind of open up the floor to whoever would like to take a take a stab at that. I can take a stab at it. Um, I certainly share the optimism and believe that um, that 2024 will be uh, either the same or or greater uh, for deal flow uh, and investment uh, than 2023. Um, but I, I do see on the LP side that uh, that interest has uh, slowed and we will have a, um, a bit of a reset in terms of the amount of capital that has been allocated to our asset class. Um, the last time interest rates were above 4% was 2007, 2008, when VC was much uh, 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 less mature of an industry. We only invested about 58 billion um, in 2008. Uh, and then uh, the following year, I think we invested uh, only about 20% less and then essentially recovered uh, uh, the next year. In 2001, it was a, a lot more steep of a recession in the venture world uh, because interest rates did not come down nearly as much as they did in 2008. Um, the VC dropped about 60% um, in the 01 uh, crash uh, and took about uh, took about five years, six years uh, to recover after about two years of dropping. Um, those were those were great. Those were a great five, six years until 2008. Uh, but I think we're going to see a little bit more like that. I think um, our recession in, in venture is going to look a lot more like the 2000 uh, bubble instead of the 2008 uh, uh, great recession. Uh, but we're down about 60% from our 2021 highs right now. And I don't see us going a lot, um, a, a lot, uh, a lot further down than this. Great. I appreciate you coming in with the numbers. Love the historical perspective. Um, Sophie, Marcus, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'd love to share some perspective from the, the WBC community. So um, with Fox, we're actually going to be fundraising in, in 2025. So luckily, don't have to be out in this market, but we, through um, our community, we have a group with a lot of emerging managers who held a discussion in December. And what they're seeing is that it's been a really, really tough fundraising market 
in 2023, or it was a really tough fundraising market in 23, and actually they don't expect it to get better in 2024. They've heard that a lot from their LP um, contacts and also more generally from, from other people raising funds. And so I think we will continue to see this kind of difficult environment for fundraising. But on the flip side, there still is a lot of dry powder um, within the venture capital industry. And so that's why I think it's not necessarily totally contradictory that we'll see um, an increase in deals, hopefully. I mean, as a venture capital investor, I do think you have to be an eternal optimist. Um, but I think that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that that will be dampened by the, the LP interest. Absolutely. I, I don't know if we would be here if we weren't all a little bit optimistic. Um, Marcus, I know you might have a different perspective altogether. Yeah, coming maybe, from maybe I have different. more like an observer role on that. <laughs> we work with just in Munich with 100 plus deep tech VCs. So we have a quite nice sensing of the market and, and get a lot, a lot of feedback. And I would the way I would put it is, uh, I think 2023, for many funds, it was even harder than for the founders or the startups to, to raise money. Uh, definitely not the, the easiest environment. And I think this will drive a, a few developments. Uh, so first of all, I think the differentiation uh, of funds will become key. Yeah. So what is the fund size? What are you really tackling? Where do you have expertise and know-how and, and can bring forward companies? I think this will be will be critical. Of course, there will be also some cleanup and maybe not all funds will survive, but I, I think that the, 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 that's a natural uh, process maybe. Um, but on the other hand, and, and this might sound a bit contradict or counterintuitive, uh, I think there will be a lot of preemptions and a lot of competition about the good deals. Um, we see that IP heavy stuff, so really coming from science and, and research background, when these companies get traction in the in this frontier or deep tech space, uh, there's a lot of competition about it. The real good teams they don't even start a fundraise. Yeah, they they get preempted, and and uh, so there's a lot of competition. Maybe also driven by the fact that the funds are looking for a fund returner, right, <laughs> to to save an existing portfolio or uh, to to put themselves in a better position for the next for their own raising. Um, so I think the competition is going going up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you 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 briefly touched on the idea of of market consolidation. Um, I'd love to open that up a little bit to the entire group as far as thoughts go on, you know, what we'll see in terms of firms being acquired or winding down this year and, and the impact that that could have on the uh, the greater market in general. Yeah. Happy for anybody to to take that mm -hmm. one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think we saw what was the stat? Um, 3,200 startups lost $27 billion in venture funding uh, last year. Uh, it's a bit of an eye opening uh, stat. And uh, that will certainly continue into 2024 because of the lag. Uh, but the underlying, um, you know, tectonic shifts that have caused these companies to, um, uh, uh, to falter, um, I think have definitely have definitely changed. Uh, when things are doing well, you find out immediately because companies raise um, at incredibly high valuations and, and and continue to raise up rounds. But when things come down, it takes a long time for the for the market to generally figure that out, especially with each, with each individual company. Um, so just because we are seeing more, uh, uh, you know, more companies go out of business um, and we will be seeing more companies go out of business this year, uh, it doesn't mean that they didn't effectively go out of business last year. Uh, so I don't think it'll really affect um, the market as a whole. I think the market will uh, will recover and is recovering right now. Um, and don't be spooked by uh, the amount of companies that perhaps announce um, that they're going out of business this year. Sure. I think that makes sense. I think, like you said, we maybe we've already seen some of those impacts just kind of passively. Um, I, I would say regardless of where you stand, it's it's become obvious, as, as Marcus, you mentioned, as you all sort of implied that, you know, securing those great deals has become a lot more competitive, uh, a lot more challenging tasks than what we would have seen, uh, you know, two or three years ago. Um, this is something we're definitely getting more used to. Uh, you know, according to our report, investors uh, plan to really lean on their networks uh, to help them gain access to those top priorities this year or top opportunities, I should say. Um, one third of investors note that network building will be their top priority for 2024. Uh, an additional third of investors also told us that they expect over half of their deals to come from existing networks. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, what, what is the importance of, of relationships and brand trust to your teams? 
And uh, where do you anticipate seeing the most value uh, from your networks in 2024? Jesse, I know that this is, uh, you know, something that you're very passionate about, as you mentioned in your intro. Would you like to kick us off on this one? Yeah, sure. Brand power and brand value is the most important part of our thesis. So we like to co-invest uh, with the best funds out there and especially on the growth side. Um, uh, brand is... Um, uh, brand is key, I believe, in venture capital, way uh, different than any other asset class out there. But um, uh, when things get rough in the markets, especially, we believe that companies seek out the most experienced investors who have you know, affected profitable outcomes for startups through deep cycles. And um, we think this cycle is no different. Um, it's called the hot hand effect, where uh, in which uh, funds that outperform in uh, one or two funds are typically expected to outperform, sometimes 40% likely to outperform um, uh, in that top quartile compared to 25% if it would be uh, if it were random um, and no performance persistence. And we think it's because um, uh, companies uh, want top funds in their cap table and on their teams because uh, they have experience and the know-how and the track record uh, to affect great outcomes and hold their hands. Um, to uh, to a profitable exit, uh, no matter what the underlying conditions are. Yeah, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. Sophie, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm I'm very much going through this real time, and I think there is a difference between the brand of the fund and the brand of you as an investor. So, um, our, our team at Fox recently left Anthemis, a very very well known fintech brand, created our own brand. No one really knows what Fox Capital is yet. And what we've really realized is actually how important the relationships are and your brand as an investor. Because if you are known um, from your portfolio companies being a great investor, being able to support, being able to connect, and then you are also connected to your um, co-investors and to your broader ecosystem, then that transition away from a very well-known brand into a new brand becomes a lot easier. But tools like Affinity, for example, have been incredibly helpful to enable us to track those relationships, maintain them and carry them on to a new brand. And so I think the the, brand, the fund brand is very important. What I'm realizing is actually your brand as an investor is very, very, very important as well. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, you know that you've you've seen great value out of the platform. We're, we're happy to hear that. I, I think that's a, a reoccurring theme for for a lot of our users who you know maybe are moving between firms that they are finding that being able to take that network with them is something that's hugely critical. Um, you know, I I know that a lot of our viewers today uh, might either be new to Affinity or you know even even checking us out for the first time on this call today. Um, do uh, you have any insights on some workflows or processes your team has created on the platform, Sophie, that you know have really helped drive efficiency and outcomes um, in terms of developing and strengthening your most important relationships? And, 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 and maybe you could give some perspective on what that looked like prior to Affinity as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think moving to across to this new fund, it's really helped us as a team um, understand our network. So um, where our strongest links are, where our um, uh, contacts have in common, and also where our gaps are. So it's enabled us to very, very quickly say, actually, we have coverage across this investor type, this industry, but, at, but this is where we need to go and build and fill those gaps that we might have backfilled from when we were Anthemis and we had other people in the network. It's also enabled us to critically track our investments um, in terms of the themes, the verticals, and that has enabled us to really understand where we're focused where and, and when we're now thinking about our thesis, what has driven our value in the past and where are those um, opportunity areas and how can we then go out and seek those? Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Marcus and Jesse, I know you've both been power users and, and advocates for the platform as well. We definitely appreciate that. Do you have any thoughts on uh, yeah. you know, some of the ways in which you're using us to, to drive those relationships? Yeah, so like I said, we're, we're a global program. So we see a couple of thousand companies every year uh, from very early stages with, let's say, very poor data quality out there in the market because it's just early and, and AI companies move super fast. Yeah. Um, so um, the company may not have even been there six months ago. So um, we built the whole infrastructure around that to see the deal flow, to pre-assess the deal flow. We run our due diligence 
results on the platform, but we also run the whole program, including what we call value creation. So within Intel, into Intel, from Intel, but also with industry partners. So we, we work a lot on how do we get our companies in front of corporate customers, of potential new clients. We help them a lot with fundraising. So all that Sophie already mentioned in, in building the network, where's the expertise? How can we help them to, with specific topics, with industry access? So all of that is is built with Affinity as a, as a core platform around it and uh, has been very helpful. And uh, like I said, 2024 will be, we will build or expand even more on that. That's great. And we're, we're happy to hear, you know, that's been helpful in dri driving that value uh, to your teams as well. Um, Jesse, any thoughts? Sure. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a big Affinity fan and I brought my previous fund alpha partners over to Affinity from, from Salesforce IQ, which I believe no longer exists. And my current fund, SAS, I, I brought them over to Affinity from a combination of Airtable and Trello. But um, I'm a big fan. And if anyone on the call needs a, uh, you know, a specific demo on how I use it and how I've and how I've used it to build my network over the last couple of years. Um, I'm more than happy to do personal demos. I've been doing that now for a while, but I, um, I could talk about it uh, uh, quite in depth. But uh, one big process that we use here at SAS is, um, is team uh, team introductions. So, for example, uh, sending introductions to our portfolio companies um, for our portfolio companies to other investors when they're raising follow on rounds. Um, uh, previously or without affinity, oftentimes you have a Rolodex, something that's cold, um, a sort of dead information of email addresses and, you know, maybe notes on, on what funds do. But uh, with affinity, it's pretty easy to coordinate with your team and your outside external network to figure out who knows whom best at the most relatable, not relatable, but the most related and relevant funds. Um, and to track those um, as a project management system, as well as a, a relationship database. So, um, uh, so making introductions has been um, uh, uh, incredibly effective through Affinity, and managing that process for each individual portfolio company um, uh, is really helpful. Well, that's that's great to hear, Jesse. You might be. Uh happy to uh, know that we are in the early stages of developing some reporting around uh, introductions as well to make it a little bit easier both for you to share internally and to uh, share with your portfolio or with your uh, you know with with your with your uh, company's markets as far as the value that you are delivering so um, hopefully save you guys a couple of headaches there and I'll, I'll definitely keep you in the loop as that's uh, as, as there's more news on that um, would love to uh, would love to shift gears a little bit. We've touched on it a few times. The idea that you know AI is going to play a big role in 2024. Um, we heard from 84 percent of investors that they either have already invested in AI uh, or they plan to invest in AI in 2024 to improve deal flow processes. Um, while we've also heard that the sheer amount of data investors need to stay ahead has also increased with 30% of firms now using at least seven unique data sources for deal sourcing alone. Uh, to the floor, I'd love to ask, wh where does your firm stand today on the AI spectrum? Do you have thoughts on how it's going to impact deal making overall in, in 2024? Uh, maybe maybe I'll start with Marcus, as you've, you've brought this up a few times. Love to get your, your insight here. Yeah, uh, um, again, a global program, so tons of different sources, tons of different geographical, uh, uh, let say, differences. Um, so how we use it, we, we use, uh, let's say, Affinity as the central hub for all this data. So we connect several external data sources, some you can license, some where we have our own tools in place to, to screen the market, let's say, and, and to really source uh, initial, let's say, leads, not even deals. Um, but we also use or we augment this via an AI tooling, a basic simple model for us to pre-filter and pre-evaluate deals and then to serve it and, and see where does it go into our deal flow. But as our most of our deal flow so far has come from recommendations, mainly from VCs, so 90% of the, the deal flow stems from VCs. We use this also to circle back to VCs and say, look, this is what we see. Does it re reflect in your deal flow? How do you see that? Um, and for us, it's important to stay connected to these companies early on, even, even if it's too early for us, for our program or for these things. So 
like a market sensing, this is this is critical for us. Um, and on the other hand, we also use this, like I mentioned before, to 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 trace back the value we create for these companies, for the funds, for companies, but of course also for Intel. And doing this the right way creates a ton of data, which is super valuable uh, and, and, and helps us also going forward. Um, but this is where we use Affinity, yeah. Great, and and happy to hear that. Um, um, Sophie, did you have an idea as far as the uh, you know where you're where you're bringing AI in, or where you anticipate to um, overall thoughts on the impact of it? Yeah, I think I guess I, I'd like to speak to the overall impact of it with my optimism hat on, which is um, something I'm really passionate about is increasing diversity within venture capital and corresponding funding into female founders, and I think historically when deal sourcing has been relatively network based which is obviously great it has led to um a, a slight amount of you know investing in the same pools and actually my hope is that with these tools there's more data the the net is a lot broader that actually will start to um one surface a lot more diverse founders but actually really start to understand the value and the potential of that pool of, of founders. And so I think that my hope is that that we'll see a real step change in, in hopefully those really depressing figures at the moment. Agreed. Um, and Jesse, I, I know that maybe you'll challenge me on this word, but I know you're taking a little bit more cautious approach when it comes to uh, AI uh, so far. Would you love to uh, you know sort of give your perspective on that and where you see it having an impact on either your team or the market in general? Yeah, I'm cautious. I don't really trust it yet for anything deal flow related. Um, uh, we source our deals uh, almost entirely from our uh, network of trusted friends and, and colleagues in the industry. So uh, it's not much that AI can do to help us uh, build our network and strengthen those relationships today. Um, if we use it today, it's mostly for um summarizing market data sometimes it's better and faster at that than a quick google search um, but tomorrow uh, we are uh, we believe that we'll be able to optimize our personal workflows things like um uh, uh scheduling and um, maybe pass emails unfortunately but uh, to use those to sort of leverage our time and spend um spend more you know uh, brain power on the things that really matter like uh, spending quality time with our connections and um and building and building trust in the uh, in the industry yeah i i think that that's um you know that's something we're hearing from a lot of investors is that they're using it um first and foremost to um either modernize or you know sort of reduce the labor that goes behind a lot of those manual tasks um and then as that evolves we'll start to see people maybe trust a little bit more of their their overall deal process decisions or strategy um not fully to ai maybe but start to bring it in as they gain more trust in that system um you know in, in terms of um data sets. Uh, I would love to hear about, you know, how your firms are, are gaining the most value from bringing in more data. Um, are there any processes you're focused on this year to become a little bit more data driven? Um, Sophie, maybe you'd like to speak a little bit to this. Yeah, I think um, uh, I imagine I can't be as helpful as, as I imagine others on the call because we're just starting out. But I think that's the, a really exciting thing about starting a new firm is that you have a clean slate. And I think actually the timing of this with the innovation within AI applications, data sources and tools for venture capital is really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, we, we're in the moment we're in the, our market, we're assessing kind of the different data sources that we can pull in and, and then evaluating how, um, how we can move forward on that. Excellent. Um, Jesse, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I've been working a lot with venture data for uh, for a number of years now, and I'm just really constantly disappointed uh, with the um, with the quantity and the quality of private data. Um, it's sort of in the uh, original challenge with private markets is that data and um, uh, and communications are generally private. So we. Uh, if you run a business like what we like how we run a business uh, you want more data you want more data on 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 deal flow and on performance um and on why things uh, 
uh, and, and and why things work. But unfortunately, um, you know, unless you're working with you know, peer reviewed articles um, uh, in respect to journals, uh, there's really not much data that you can trust uh, uh, in the industry. Um, uh, and the more you sort of settle on a metric to, um, uh, to measure performance and measure activity, the more it sort of becomes a game system, something. Um, uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, and I think that's relatively true. Uh, but, um, uh, but we do try and use data, uh, if we can, um, uh, cause you can't improve processes unless you track them, unfortunately, and measure them. Um, so we do try and, um, uh, utilize data to determine um, how we are uh, uh, penetrating the market, um, um, what kind of deals we're seeing, and, and how we can try to improve um, the quality of our deal flow. Gotcha. Um, are, are there any you know best practices uh, within Affinity that you could share, just general advice in terms of getting more value out of that data? Um, my best practice is uh, if you can do it in one system, do it in one system. And Affinity is my favorite system right now um, uh, to sort of live out of. And the more external sources of data um, that you introduce into your workflow, uh, the more opportunity for leakage um, and cold data to arise. So um, if you store if you store documents, find try and find a way to store them um, on Affinity and. Uh, and these guys did not tell me to say this, but uh, <laughs> uh, but if you have an agenda for internal, um, you know, IC meetings and such, uh, try and put them into Affinity. Try and put them in, in the notes. Um, uh, the Affinity uh, notes search is really powerful. Um, and uh, if you have if you have notes in uh, in different Google Docs or, or, or other places, uh, um, sometimes you'll lose a lot of that information. Um, if you do. Um, if you track your deal flow in other sources, uh, uh, in other in other systems, try and do it in Affinity if you can. Um, if you do portfolio management support um, in other systems, if you do project management in other systems, um, uh, uh, try and do them in Affinity. Affinity is very flexible um, and will allow you to um, to incorporate these processes within. Um, there are some things that you can't do within Affinity, um, where you, you know you absolutely have to go to a different uh, service, and I won't name them here, um, but. Um, uh, uh, but if you can remove the friction and remove that external uh, products and services, um, your data ultimately uh, will be much more, um, much more clean, uh, much more accurate, which in turn drives the value of the whole system as, as a whole. Um, if you have inaccurate data, old data, um, affinity will and or your and affinity and any process or service that you use uh, will be relatively useless. Oh. Thank you for that, Jesse. We definitely did not prompt you, but I would imagine some of our account executives might be reaching out to you to co-pilot their next demo call. Uh, <laughs> uh, Marcus, did you have some thoughts yeah, on yeah, that? May maybe adding to this, so uh, as you may know, uh, OKRs, the, the famous concept was first developed and deployed uh, within Intel and measure what matters, right? So there's a certain value, we call it speak with data. So remove the anecdotal part, uh, really prove the things with data. And to do that, uh, or oh, one that helps to get more done with few resources. Yeah. So relying on trusted and, and proper data is, is critical to, to enhance productivity. And I think this is also something we will see in the VC world going forward due to the, let's say, circumstances out there. Um, and on the other hand, uh, and this ties into Jesse's recommendation, uh, you need to have a single source of truth for that. Um, so bringing this all together in one place, uh, defining taxonomy stuff, how you look at things like defining the vocabulary, how you talk about your data and how you use that. This is critical to, to really leverage it and, and to make the most out of it. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Sophie, did you did you have something you wanted to to add to that? No, I think I would just agree with um, everyone on the call, and that um, I think with Affinity, there's whenever you think you've realized you've got a handle of it, there's so much more that it can give. And so, just thinking about starting with a process that you find that is very um, important to either your fund or yourself. And then using that to start exploring the other features and sort of adding on, because it can be quite overwhelming. 
when there is so much uh, so much to offer of a platform is that you know start small and and, and build within it. Absolutely, and 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 for those of you who are uh, you know current users, don't hesitate to reach out to your customer success representative either. They're more than happy to help uh, strategize with you if you have some thoughts on things you'd like to do but aren't sure how to do them in Affinity. Um, they'll help you either navigate that or um, let you know that we are working on it, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I'd love to end the call on sort of a, you know, hopefully hopefully an optimistic note. Um, I know that I, you know, we've taken a lot of your guys' time today. So um, one, I'd love to know one word you would use to describe your expectations as an investor for uh, 2024. Um, Jesse, why don't we start with you? Resilient. Resilient. Love it. Sophie? Uh, I'm going to say bifurcation, which is a bit of a weird word, but I think I think we'll really see uh, some funds and companies really move away from the pack, those that are kind of daring um, and resilient. And then I think we will continue to see funds that will struggle, funds will be acquired and startups that will close down. Perfect. Marcus, one word. Yeah, more on the startup landscape, what we will see there on a technology perspective. It's two words, but I would say it's AI everywhere. AI everywhere. Love it. Awesome. Uh, thank you all so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Our, our, I'm sure our viewers do as well. Um, and, and thank you to our viewers for joining us. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the topics we've spoken about today, uh, please follow the QR code and take a look at Affinity's 2024 Investment Predictions Report. And you can find out more about Sophie Winwood uh, at wvce.tech or foxcapital.com. Uh, for Jesse Bloom and SAS Ventures, you can go to sasventurecapital.com. And for Marcus, you can check out intelignite.com. Um, we'll also be sending you the report after this webinar, along with some great resources from our panelists and a recording of today's session, in case you might like to share that with your colleagues. Uh, big thank you again to our speakers and to our viewers at home. Jesse, Sophie, Marcus, appreciate your time, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. Thanks. Take care.